Whoops. Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to another Jacobin Talk. My name's Kale. I'm the video producer here at Jacobin. And every week uh, on weeknights, we do uh, three times a week, we'll do a conversation or a lecture or a debate with uh, left uh, public intellectuals, thinkers, writers, organizers about important politics for the left, uh, working through you know, old and new historic debates and uh, and sometimes topical, sometimes evergreen. Um, tonight, it's uh, a little bit of both actually. Um, and uh, so I'm gonna be joined by Jen Pan and Ariella Thornhill. Jen Pan is a writer for The New Republic, but she's also an author in Jacobin. Her most recent piece is called Workplace Anti-Racism Trainings Aren't Helping. Um, it's partially inspired uh, this talk tonight. Um, Ariella is a board member of Jacobin. Uh, you can see her work on the Jacobin YouTube page, actually, that she was a uh, recent uh, co-host on weekends. Um, and hope to see a lot more of both of you, honestly. Um, uh, before we get going, before I hand it off to them to talk about the history of diversity trainings and uh, how it's used politically in the workplace, I just wanted to quickly run through some of the other videos that are coming up this week. On Wednesday, we have Christian Parenti, who's going to be talking about his new book out from Verso on the radical Alexander Hamilton, um, kind of a uh, looking back at the historical legacy of the individual and uh, through a leftist lens. Um, very interesting. Uh, if you are not aware, um, it's, yeah, it, it's gonna be good. It's not at all like the musical, I promise. Uh, and then <laughs> uh, on Friday, we have Stephanie Luce talking about the politics of full employment, um, what it means for uh, for workers if, for instance, Every single person has a job or the ability to get a new job through uh, uh, through a, a massive government jobs program. What does that do to labor markets, for instance, and uh, and the, the boss's ability to fire people? Um, so that one's going to be interesting. And then on Saturday, uh, for another episode of Weekends with Anna Kasparian and Nando Vila, we have one of our favorites, Amber Lee Frost, talking about her new Catalyst essay, which is just incredible and uh you know it's no you know she's not pulling any punches um <laughs> it's extremely good uh and sobering and everyone should read the essay you don't have to read it before saturday but you know if you can <laughs> you should um on that note the last thing i'll say before i hand it off uh is please hit like please hit subscribe please share the stream uh, and uh, enjoy. Okay, thanks, Kale. Um, and obviously, thanks to Jacobin for having us on. Um, so I think just to kick off, um, I want to start by giving like a very basic definition of the diversity industry, uh, which I do want to say is more commonly now called diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and I myself have sort of started referring to it as the social justice industry, um, because I think one major turn over the last few years is that you now see people in that very industry saying, well, we need to go beyond diversity. Um, so I'll talk about that shift in a little bit. Um, but for the most part, you know, just wanted to put it out there that we'll be using the terms diversity industry um, and social justice industry, like pretty much interchangeably. So, so what is the diversity industry? It is basically this massive unregulated industry that exists to help government agencies, uh, private sector companies, schools, and like all kinds of other institutions work toward achieving either a certain level of diversity um, or stay in compliance with laws around discrimination or you know, train, help train their staff members in racial sensitivity um, or of course any combination of the above. Um, so this industry kind of encompasses like trainers, consultants, workshops, advisors, like any kind of service that helps employers sort of meet these DEI goals. Um, so Kale, can we get the first slide? 
So in 2003, the diversity industry was estimated to be worth around $8 billion, uh, which almost certainly means that it's worth way more than that today. Some form of diversity training is mandated at almost every Fortune 500 company. Um, about half of all mid-sized firms, which are companies <laughs> that have anywhere between like 250 uh, to 1,000 employees, also use diversity training. And then two thirds of colleges and universities in the US today also use some kind of diversity training. So I think, you know, to kind of bring it back to the present, um, we've seen this industry explode even more uh, recently in light of, of course, the recent protests against police brutality and racism, um, where you see all kinds of companies and organizations sort of rushing to publicly reaffirm their commitment to racial justice. Um, and obviously, like right now, the kind of most famous practitioner of this type of training is Robin D'Angelo, the author of White Fragility. Um, but, uh, you know, she makes like $20,000, $30,000, like doing a single training. Um, and, you know, there have been like a ton of critiques and like responses to her. So I won't get too much into that there. Um, but I will say, you know, I recently found a Google Doc of just black owned diversity training services. Um, and there were something like 300 just black owned DEI consulting firms on that list. So again, I think that's just an indication of, you know, how, how much this industry is growing, how much potential there is for it to grow even more. Um, and I also want to add like really quickly that even though I think the bulk of the diversity industry is kind of these third party services uh, and workshops and trainings that, um, that, you know, companies and schools can buy, um, lots of companies also have in-house diversity experts. Um, so now you're seeing a rise in like managerial positions like chief diversity officer or like chief of equity. Um, and just FYI, like all the big tech firms like Google, Facebook, like they all have somebody in this position. All of the big banks have somebody in this position. Um, obviously, you know, salaries always can vary, but these, these are like six figure jobs. Like they are C-level positions. So um, I think, you know, I just want to quickly touch on how exactly the industry got started. Um, in 1964, you have the Civil Rights Act, um, and this makes it illegal for employers to discriminate on the basis of race. Um, and Title VII of the Civil, of the Civil Rights Act also uh, establishes the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which is the federal agency that kind of monitors and investigates workplace discrimination. Um, so this was a big step forward in terms of reducing racial discrimination on the job. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, uh, it was, it, like I said, it was a step forward. At the same time, the EEOC guidelines on what it meant to discriminate were very, very vague. So basically we have the Civil Rights Act saying, you know, you can't discriminate anymore, um, but they don't stipulate what your hiring practices should be, what your firing practices should be. Um, or what kind of training you should give your employees. Um, so, you know, the, like that kind of creates a situation where all of these companies are sort of left to fend for themselves in terms of figuring out how to comply. Um, and then right after, this, right after the Civil Rights Act is passed, you see, you know, a wave of discrimination lawsuits against employers, obviously because those employers were discriminating. Um, so companies are kind of like desperately scrambling to figure out how to prevent being sued and also how to stay in compliance with these new laws. Um, and, and, you know, I think this obviously in many ways creates a kind of perfect breeding ground for a new industry to arise to help employers stay in compliance with the law or figure out how they can skirt it. Um, and then in addition to that, of course, you know, especially now, there's obviously this PR element where companies, they, they don't want any sort of public relations scandal where they look racist or sexist. So, you know, a few years ago, we saw that um, there were instances of racial profiling of black customers at Sephora and Starbucks, and obviously then a public outcry. Um, so then, you know, then these companies sort of like rushed to say like, oh, well, we're going to fix this by instituting more diversity training and more anti-racism training. Um, but I think, you know, I, I, I think the thing to keep in mind is that because the law is so vague um, and because so much of it is left up to the corporations and to the private sector, the standards around diversity and anti-racism in the workplace are basically changing all the time. Um, so Kale, can we get 
the second slide. Yes, thanks. Okay. So, so this is kind of just like an overview of the timeline. Um, and basically what you can see is that diversity training and diversity compliance has changed a lot over the last few decades. So in the 60s and 70s, um, as I mentioned, there was obviously a lot of emphasis on compliance with the law, but you also start to see some companies um, begin to talk about diversity as a moral imperative. Um, and this is when you start to see trainings um, around you know, getting workers to kind of reduce prejudice in the workplace. And then in the 80s, we have a backlash to affirmative action under Reagan, um, and he institutes funding cuts to the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. So um, during this time period, a lot of workplaces kind of shift to an assimilation model of diversity training, um, which is, which is, I guess, kind of, you know, trying to get women and people of color to speak and behave more like their white male counterparts. So actually, like when Ariella and I were talking about this earlier, she pointed out that in, um, you know, she pointed out that this is sort of the basis of the more recent Sheryl Sandberg lean in mode, you know, like if you just tried harder to keep up with the boys and act more like them, you too can bootstrap your way to the C level. Um, so then after the 80s, uh, the 90s is when you see a shift to the kind of classic feel good Coca-Cola liberal multiculturalism that I think we now all think about uh, when we think of like diversity trainings. Um, and so this is the type of diversity training that's about, you know, understanding and celebrating all of our differences. Um, you know, the, uh, uh, this training insists that like diversity is, is our strength and diversity is actually really great for businesses productivity and, you know, it, it can be good for your bottom line as well. Um, and then, you know, to fast forward to today, I think, we are seeing another shift where we're kind of leaving behind that 90s multiculturalism and moving to um, to what lots of people are calling equity, um, or even sometimes these initiatives are called racial justice. So I want to focus on this more recent shift for just a second because you know I think I think a lot of people, especially on the left, kind of understand at this point that there's a form of like corny corny corporate diversity that can be kind of shallow, right? Like lots of people know that this 90s Coca-Cola diversity is kind of just window dressing and like, you know, people know it's not good enough. Um, and the response then, um, or, you know, what people are leaning toward now is that we have to shift away from diversity to serious racial equity. And I think that sounds good, but I also think in many cases, when you start to pull apart what that means in the context of workplace initiatives, um, it's not actually all that clear what people are talking about or like when people say equity, is that really very different from the diversity that came before? Um, and this is something that Walter Ben Michaels has talked about um, from time to time also. So, you know, just to use a brief example, um, like from my own life, like recently I was in a meeting with some people from a few progressive organizations, um, and everybody had kind of gotten together to discuss um, how to push forward racial justice initiatives in the workplace. And so everybody went around and sort of said what they thought was the biggest obstacle to racial justice in the workplace. And almost every single person said, I think that the, you know, I think that the biggest obstacle is that there are not enough people of color in leadership. And then at one point, um, the facilitator of the discussion um, was like, the lack of, of people of color in leadership is a structural inequity. And I just kind of like paused for a minute um, and was a little taken aback because at least in my mind, like the structure of the workplace is the employer has power over the employees and diversifying management. I mean, whatever your thoughts are on that, like that doesn't really seem like a structural change. That seems like a personnel change, you know? Um, and I also wanna say that increasing representation at a firm, uh, even at the very top, has always been a goal of the diversity industry um, from the 70s to the 90s to now. So I think, again, I think even though we're starting to see yet another shift um, in how people are trying to push beyond diversity um, and even using more radical language, I think it's still worth taking a look, taking a hard look at, you know, what exactly they're advocating for 
and whether it's actually different from what has come before. Um, so I think on that note, um, Ariella, I'm going to hand it over to you. And I know you're going to talk a little bit more about the relationship between like the diversity industry and like company profit. So take it away. Yeah, so companies never do something because they just want to do it, <laughs> right? They have a set of incentives as a firm and profits are their are chief among those set of incentives. The other is managing personnel and then their consumer relationships. So businesses started to get this idea that diversity could actually be really profitable and really good. And I want Kale to run this, what women want clip right now, uh, because this is indicative of this shift in the mindset that happened. This movie was um, made in the year 2000, but the shift really started to take place like in the late 90s, early 2000s and beyond. Huh. This is good. More insightful than I would have thought. This line doesn't feel exactly right. If you're thinking that that line isn't perfect, I agree. It needs a little work. There's something not exactly right about it, isn't there? I mean, it's it's not bad. It's insightful, actually. It's just... Well, what do you think this woman's thinking? Uh, well... Uh, let's see. Uh... She's thinking about what she wants out of life. What's she going to accomplish? I mean, how's she going to do all that? I mean, women, you know, they think about that a lot. I mean, surprisingly, a lot. Uh, they worry all the time about everything. You're so right. How do you know that? Well, you know, even I had a mother. <laughs> all right. So that racist ass Melly Gibson <laughs> clip is indicative of a sense that many firms had that diversifying their personnel would lead to innovations. It would lead to um, better insights into their customer base. And the premise of the movie, although it's cheesy and horrible, is that this man who can then gain insight into the thoughts of women by being able to listen to them is better at doing his work and better at working with women. We've now reached the point that what women want was trying to get at with implicit bias trainings, trainings that are really meant to supplant the experiential narrative in a person's mind with other experiences. Um, so firms started to think diversity was profitable for that reason, but also for others. The foremost is that it protects their bottom line. Um, businesses started to care a lot more about diversity after they were paying sometimes billion, half billion dollar payouts um, to settle diversity and discrimination lawsuits. Um, they also wanted to make sure that they were keeping up with trends in personnel changes. So in 1987, a report called Workforce 2000 was published and it changed the focus about diversity once it seemed to make the case that diversity was inevitable. The press misunderstood the report's claim that there would be a big marginal increase in minorities in the workforce. They thought that this meant that there would just be a big increase. They didn't understand that marginal versus net increase. But this fueled the idea that diversity was inevitable and companies needed to find a way to manage it. And the diversity industry expanded to meet that need. Um, and as Jen said, it employed a wide range of strategies. And it pulled these strategies from academia, from the social justice world, from nonprofits, from anti-racism educators, sociology, social psychology, and more recently from tech. Um, I want Kale to bring up for me the slide from Talent Lift that explains the top 10 reasons to incorporate workplace diversity. So we have higher innovation. Um, it leads to a variety of different perspectives, faster problem solving. I'm not reading them in order. Okay, <laughs> increased creativity, higher innovation, variety of different perspectives, faster problem solving, better decision making, increased profits, higher employee engagement, reduced employee turnover, better company reputation, and improved hiring results. Um, so some of these 
you can see the case that's being made here. If you're picking from a pool of applicants and you're not considering qualified people on the basis of their race, gender, or sexual orientation, you're losing out on talent. But others are more spurious claims. Um, so one, pretty much every single one of these studies cites a report by the McKinsey Institute that seems to make the case that more diverse companies are more profitable. So um, Kale, could you bring up this graphic? I started to dig into this because I really wanted to see what the mechanism was and I couldn't find one. Um, in fact, the report itself says, while correlation does not equal ca causation, greater gender and ethnic diversity in corporate leadership doesn't automatically translate into more profit. The correlation does indicate that when companies commit themselves to diverse leaderships, they are more successful. More diverse companies, we believe, are better able to win top talent and improve their customer orientation, employee satisfaction and decision making, and all that leads to a virtuous cycle of increasing returns. This in turn suggests that other kinds of diversity, for example, in age, sexual orientation, and experience, such as a global mindset and cultural flu fluency, are also likely to bring some level of competitive advantage for companies that can attract and retain such diverse talent. So. It doesn't really matter if diversity is more profitable or if diversity leads to more innovation because these metrics are about a belief system that's used to manage corporate employees. And as long as it's believed, they will keep using it. We saw this with Sheryl Sandberg's lean in approach, right? She you know, was notorious for going into these companies and basically training women to be more assertive and to access parts of them that you know, they felt weren't feminine or whatever and, and assimilate to the workplace. And it's not necessarily true that that works. Um, most famously, it didn't work for hotel workers that were trying to organize. <laughs> but, it doesn't really matter because these companies have tons of income to pour into these things and they will try to implement anything that can make them more profitable, but they'll also try to implement anything that will make them have more control over their employees. Personnel is one of the biggest expenses in the overheads of the company and controlling it, including retaining it, um, cutting down on trainings, for new employees, not diversity training. And things like that are all part of why companies push for these kinds of things. Um, and so it's become so common and deeply ingrained in these top companies that they are now tying executive and managerial bonuses to the promotion, retention, and hiring of diverse people. So I have a quote here um, from payscale.com. It says, Catalyst CEO Deborah Gillis strongly advocates increasing monetary bonuses for leaders who deliberately promoted women and docking the pay for those who don't. Now, just a little aside for me, I fail to see how that will make you have a friendlier relationship with women or want to hire them if you don't promote them and your pay is docked. But <laughs> the quote and continues. Also, and also, what about like if a woman you hired finds out you got like $500 to hire her? Yeah, for real. I mean, all of these things really undermine solidarity, particularly the way it's articulated through these incentive programs, but the ideology itself also does. And the incentive programs just kind of like make that more acute. Um, so the quote goes on, we know that women face a glass ceiling and for women of color, it's a concrete ceiling. Gillis said in an interview with Fairy God Boss in 2016, I didn't make that up, that's a real thing. Given that 95% of leadership positions at some of the largest companies are occupied by men, they need to be champions of gender equality, end quote. Tying diversity goals to financial benefits signifies that companies take diversity advancement goals more seriously and pushes leaders to be accountable for their behaviors and confront their unconscious bias. Quote, who gets promoted? Who gets that new opportunity, said Gillis? It should be people who manage in a way that's inclusionary. So. This is part of a broader trend, and now Microsoft, Intel, Johnson & Johnson, Facebook, and Uber have all introduced programs like this. And Google was actually asked to create a program like this by its employees. 
So the rank and file at Google walked out because of a sexist discrimination issue in their workplace, a broad, broad issue that is long standing and has not been solved, by the way. And one of their demands, along with Google's shareholders, was to tie bonus compensation to sustainability metrics like executive diversity. So that is why so much money pours into the diversity from the private sector. Um, and it's only increasing. Like Jen said, people are really struggling to grapple with these problems. Every time there's an issue of systematic racial injustice or sexism, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation and identity, firms scramble to try to incorporate the kind of new theories of the day um, in terms of racial justice into their bottom line, into their business model, and into their managerial processes. So now, Jen is going to tell us how diversity and equity initiatives operate in the workplace today to undermine and divide workers. So I think actually um, what you said about the Google employees, like kind of asking for like more, I guess, you know, accountability or like asking for certain types of training in this area. Um, that was something that I started thinking about because uh, the staff at the New York Times has also asked for mandatory anti-racism training. Um, I think that you know there are a lot of kind of white collar professionals or like white collar people in in creative fields who look at these initiatives and think this is a step forward. You know, like this shows that the company the company is doing is doing something. And especially again, contrasting like corny '90s diversity mm -hmm. to like radical good like right now right now equity or anti-racism like it does seem like a step forward um so i do want to take a minute to look at how how these trainings actually operate in the workplace um and and what the effect is on workers so um you know, so so this was the subject of the article that I wrote for Jacobin a few weeks ago, um, which I think is, thanks, Kale. <laughs> I think this is also linked in the description box. So if you want to read it, please do. Um, but basically, um, we have tons of studies at this point that have shown that diversity training doesn't work. Uh, diversity training doesn't really make offices more diverse. Um, mandatory anti-bias or anti-racist training in the workplace does not actually lower people's biases or prejudices, and unsurprisingly, everyone hates them. So um, I think now we want to cue up a video from Dr. Phil, um, and this is a clip of what's called a privilege walk. Um, if you have spent any time in like the nonprofit or activist spaces, um, you're probably familiar with this. But this is an exercise that's used in um, a lot of educational settings. And this is kind of like a cornerstone of anti-racism training. Um, so let's watch. I'm going to be asking you a series of 35 questions. If your parents work nights and weekends to support your family, take one step back. If you are able to move through the world without fear of sexual assault, take one step forward. If you can show affection for your romantic partner in public without fear of ridicule or violence, take one step forward. The experience today definitely helped me see the world in a different perspective. I kept stepping forward. And as I was keep going forward, it was like, am I really that privileged? I didn't feel like I deserved to be up there. If you have ever been diagnosed as having a physical or mental illness, if the primary language spoken in your household growing up was not English, if you have ever tried to change your speech or mannerisms to gain credibility, I'm from a small town in Connecticut, so I've heard like I live in a bubble. Because I'm white or because I have blonde hair, like, it doesn't mean I should be in front of them. If you can go anywhere in the country and easily find the kinds of hair products you need that match your skin color, if you were embarrassed about your clothes or house while growing up, if you can legally marry the person you love, if you love, would never think twice about calling the police when trouble occurs, take one step forward. I'm already a double minority being African American, also being a homosexual male. I'm always like expecting myself to be further back. So um, if, you, if you ever feel compelled to watch the whole clip, I, uh, you can find it online. Um, it's about five minutes long. Um, and basically, like at the end, everybody involved feels like shit. 
like all the kids at the back <laughs> are like all the kids are all, all the it's kids so are sad like, I know it's really sad it's really they're sad. like I, mean, I just thought like, my parents did a good job and I didn't think I was that bad off and exactly oh. exactly yeah like the kids at the back are all like oh my god like I didn't know that like my life was so awful and then the kids at the front are like I didn't know I was so awful so and so I guess that's how you know that the training worked right like at the end like everybody everybody feels bad um and you know the takeaway of the exercise of course is that some people have certain privileges um, and they tend to be invisible. Um, but at the same time, this exercise obviously conflates sort of a number of different dynamics. Like it talks about bullying, but then it also talks about like unemployment and wages and like night shifts. Um, and then talks about like speaking a language other than English at home. And those are all like very different things. And, you know, I don't I don't know how helpful it is to lump them all into the privilege basket. And importantly, I, I don't think that doing that, that is lumping them into the privilege basket, actually gives us um, any direction on where to go in terms of like doing anything about inequality, right? Um, and obviously the Dr. Phil example is is Dr. Phil. And like, these are college <laughs> students. So, you know, this isn't like, this isn't like everybody, but I think that I think that this video is instructive because like this is ultimately where these mandatory workplace anti-racism kind of consciousness raising um, sessions end up like there's no real takeaway. It's just kind of an exercise in like trying to change the way that people think and like trying to change the way that people feel and like perhaps trying to change the way that people speak as well. Um, but then of course on top of that like i said before they don't even they don't even work to do any of that they don't reduce people's biases um like like i said we have a pretty robust set of research at this point um from psychology and other social sciences that show that these interventions do not reduce people's prejudices um in some weird cases they even like more deeply ingrain those prejudices um and yeah actually, Jen, can i can I cut in with an yeah. example that I found? So one of the exercises that used to happen in the late 70s and 80s was to have participants list like stereotypes they associated with different identities. It was actually used to try the firm in a discrimination lawsuit and they won because they encouraged employees to say things like black people are lazy. Right, and they encouraged employees to say literally racist things. In, at, and a mandatory training at work. Right, so right. That's a, yeah. that's a very, very, very bad example of this. But these trainings have never, they distill these feelings for workers. They distill these feelings of difference mm -hmm. rather than removing or ameliorating them. Exactly. Um, and there was actually another study from just last year um, that looked at it, uh, it. So I think like two psychologists um, wanted to see what happens when you talk to specifically educated liberals about white privilege. Um, so they wanted to see if talking to educated liberals about white privilege would change the way that they felt about poor black people or change the way that they felt about poor white people. And after they conducted the experiment, they found that, um, so basically if you sit you know, a group of educated liberals down and you explain white privilege to them, and then you measure how much empathy they have for poor black people after the experiment, empathy didn't go up. However, their empathy for poor white people went down. So I think that's, again, like this really interesting example of, you know, it, it didn't work in terms of making people like more racially open-minded, but it like kind of backfired in a class direction as well, which is like the worst of both worlds, right? So yes, so these programs are um, questionable at best. Um, and I, I think, so, so as, as you know, we had been talking about before, um, I think we're seeing now, you know, a lot of kind of well-intentioned like liberals and like white collar professionals, like advocating for these trainings again. Um, part of that I think is because the Trump administration and like Tucker Carlson and some other right-wing people like recently found out about anti-racism training and like lost their shit. And like Trump is like, we need to ban this from, you know, federal agencies. Um, and they all think that it's like a Marxist plot, you know? Um, and and you I know, just want to say, Karl Marx famously advocated for people to do that walk of privilege exercise. Right, exactly. The privilege, walk, <laughs> the privilege walk is in uh, Capital Volume One, and it's so canon. Everyone... <laughs> exactly. Um, yes. So yes. So so you know, the right wing thinks that this is like creeping Marxism, um, and and I do want to say, like, I think that a lot of these trainings 
do come from a genuine impulse, um, especially when you know it's it's employees who are advocating for them. I do think they come from a genuine impulse to want to kind of address or stamp out interpersonal uh, racism in the workplace. Um, but you know we have to be extremely careful because, like I said, they don't work. Um, and then the second part is this is like this is like a little more disturbing. But I I I feel like there's starting to be more evidence that employers are using these types of social justice like trainings to surveil and discipline workers. So I talk a little bit about this in my article, but I started combing through the Harvard Business Review, like to see what managers were saying about anti-racism trainings. And I found this one CEO who, you know, a big, big proponent of racial equity in the workplace. He was like, mandatory anti-racism trainings for everybody. And then on top of that, he was like, every year I make my employees give a personal racial justice goal that they're going to achieve over the course of the year. And then uh, when, you know, when it's time for performance reviews, we evaluate like how much progress they've made on that goal. And it's just like, what? <laughs> and then there was like this other management expert who, you know, basically doubled down on at will employment. Um, by looking at the Amy Cooper case, which of course is the you know racist white woman who like called the cops on a uh, black bird watcher in Central Park. Um, and he basically pointed to her and was like, Amy Cooper's employer firing her immediately for being openly racist outside of work is like exactly like what we should be doing. Like this, like this is the kind of policy we should be implementing, no tolerance. And like, obviously the point is, obviously the point is like not to shed a tear for Amy Cooper because like, who cares? But like, we should also not rush to stick a like progressive mask on at will employment, right? Um, and then I, one last example that I have to tell because it's so dystopian is, um, Northeastern University researchers are currently working on an AI machine that is meant to monitor workers' speech, uh, nonverbal cues, and eventually, quote, physiological signals in order to assess how much unconscious bias they have and how much they're bringing to the workplace. So, like, you know, the researchers, the, the researchers were trying to, like, pass this off as, like, oh, this is, like, a great tool that will, like, help managers, you know, like figure out like who should get more speaking time or whatever. But it's like a machine that collects your speech and physiological signals and delivers it straight to your manager's office so they can like figure out what to do with you. Like we don't want that, you know? <laughs> so um, yeah, so, so I think that there are just a number of ways in which, uh, again, um, despite some good intentions, I think despite some honestly good intentions, um, this is not the road that I think, you know, we should be going down. Um, at the end of the day, when it's the employers who are still ultimately deciding what's racist, who's racist, who's not racist, like, I don't think any of these initiatives are a win for workers. Yeah, so I I, guess, yeah, sorry. No, I think that's exactly right. And I think that, you know, the shift towards asking for racial justice and social justice in the workplace asking management for that shows that people one have a genuine desire to address these problems and i think most people do but it also shows that they don't and can't conceive of other potential solutions um and i think that the reason that they're so amenable to management is precisely because they're not really threatening um right. So if you're cool with it, Jen, I can go into how it reduces solidarity. Yeah, I was going to say, unless I you have you more have tech of, examples. <laughs> I'm sure there are many more, and I'm like I found more. Out. You have I more? found one. Yeah, I found one where a man was advocating for his um, consultancy firm to do anti-bias trainings, and he's like, "We go in and we observe behavior, then we make an AI model, and we." model the company's growth for five years. And we show that with these sets of behaviors, these people will move up and be promoted and these people won't. And it's unclear like how this model works. He doesn't really go into it and I don't see why he would, but it's common enough that there are like multiple articles in Harvard Business Review and Science Daily about people using AI in the workforce. And that this is not the only kind of avenue that mm -hmm. they're using that for. It's just mm -hmm. one of them. And mm -hmm. the focus on 
ameliorating discrimination at work, which is a serious problem. Nobody likes to work in a place with racists um, or with people even, you know, microaggressing you. People's workplaces take up a lot of their lives and they fundamentally change the outcomes of their lives. And so like, obviously these issues are deeply, deeply important, but we can't skirt in more surveillance or empower bosses and management to basically like decide the um, outcome of a worker's life on a whim. Exactly, exactly. like you said. Yeah. So how, um, how, how do these trainings undermine solidarity? All right, so here we go. We're about to get a little bit mad, but bear with me. <laughs> so <clears throat> the biggest issue with the ideological and theoretical framework of these programs is that they treat disparities in outcomes as the effect of individual failing. They treat systematic outcomes and systemic outcomes that are caused by path dependency, the company's profit motive, competition with other firms, and internal hierarchical structures as individual problems that are caused by bad attitudes, biases, or the personal failure of bad actors, whether they are unconscious or consciously acting in bad faith. And this isn't just a corporate flaw, it's a liberal flaw. Racism and sexism are treated as the aggregate of millions of people's bad attitudes and negative emotions, rather than the consequences of capitalist accumulation and socioeconomic inertia. As Stokely Carmichael said, if a white man wants to lynch me, that's his problem. If he's got the power to lynch me, that's my problem. Racism is not a question of attitude, it's a question of power. Racism gets its power from capitalism. Thus, if you're anti-racist, whether you know it or not, you must be anti-capitalist. The power for racism, the power for sexism comes from capitalism, not an attitude. So I want to dig into how these trainings actually put forth this theoretical framework that these bad outcomes come from individual biases, unconscious thoughts, or bad actors. Kale, could you run the implicit biases clip for me? Professor Nosek and colleagues tested more than 700,000 subjects and found that more than 70% of white subjects more easily associated white faces with positive words and black faces with negative words, concluding that this was evidence of implicit racial bias. In fact, additional evidence indicates that measures of implicit bias better predict people's conduct than measures of explicit bias. I think that if you are anyone to be blunt, that it's not a white male, you potentially feel that implicit bias. Maybe you're just looking for someone that is like you because you like you, and so you wanna be around more people like you. But what's really rooted under that is that you potentially don't think that someone else is as smart or as capable, and that is coming from a place of implicit bias. Now here's some good news. Various scientists have criticized the IAT. They point out, for example, that individuals who take the test on different mm -hmm. dates often score substantially differently. <laughs> Even IAT supporters admit that implicit bias, at least as demonstrated by the test, is widespread but relatively minor and has only a small impact upon people's real world actions. In other words, the results of the test are not strong enough to predict particular behaviors by individual people. Hmm. However, let's not get too comfortable. Even if the IAT cannot predict the future conduct of any one individual on a given occasion, it still indicates how groups of people will act on average, and that is worrisome. So there you have it. That's the science behind the racism is an aggregate of bad actors theory. But racism isn't. The thing is, if you took everyone out of these firms that had some kind of unconscious bias and you replace them with the most loving, wonderful, open people who are deeply compassionate, outcomes across the board would still be the same. Competition between firms, the profit motive, all of these things, and the, the inertia of location and resource allocation create differences that become racially inflected or inflected by other kinds of 
orderings of, of people, in, including their sexual orientation, their gender identity. And so you see the way that there's a bait and switch here. The clip itself says that um, implicit bias isn't a good predictor of an individual's actions because the test results can change in a given day. But then it says that it is, it's better at predicting their actions than their explicit answers to questions. Basically the science behind this is pretty soft. It's not a good explanation, even in its own like very truncated little world of what's happening here. And even if it were to be, you wouldn't have any kind of enduring change as a result of implementing these things in the workplace. Um, so firms rely on the diversity industry because they have an incentive to manage workplace safety issues. And I do think that racism and sexism um, as well as, you know, people's gender identity and sexual orientation are workplace safety issues. But they have an incentive to manage workplace safety issues and workers' rights issues as though they're caused by bad actors, individuals, not the power structure in which those individuals exist. And this has always been the case. In the 70s, these trainings focused on compliance, which was generally telling individuals, like, don't get us in trouble by saying the wrong things. Um, in the 80s, they mixed in a focus on assimilation into workplace culture, Sheryl Sandberg style, um, and they blamed individuals for their failure to succeed at work um, and told them that if they used the approaches that they advocated, they would then do better. Um, and then in the 90s, this gave way to a kind of um, boutique multiculturalism, soft tooth, like tolerance approach. And later, to pop psych critiques of internalized racism and sexism, then shame and guilt exercises, and then to privilege theology and unconscious bias training. Um, I want to show how this bait and switch turns issues of workers' power into issues of interpersonal difference. Sorry, that was so long, but I think it's important to view that um, clip from Accenture, I think it's called, which is itself a diversity training clip. And it's making the case that if a group of individuals all decide to be better and make better choices, then the outcomes for all workers will change. But that's not true. And this clip exemplifies the liberal ethos of anti-discrimination in the workplace. Issues that are directly tied to workers' rights, like parental leave, compensation and promotions are turned into issues of feeling. But companies are not denying men paid parental leave because of feelings or paying people less because they don't like them. And insofar as these decisions might be based on bias, and I do think sometimes they are, like promote, promotion decisions or internal hiring practices, real durable changes can only come from union representation and worker power, rank and file action, 
because as soon as the boss who promotes black women or hires trans people leaves, your gains are totally lost. Um, the other thing about these trainings is that they're fundamentally unsolidaristic. They tell workers that only other workers are responsible for their issues in the workplace. That clip was just a list of interpersonal resentments for feeling judged that you had to leave early to pick up your kids or feeling as though workers, other workers in your firm and your peers don't think you are as driven and you're more entitled because you're a white man. These interpersonal issues may affect the day to day but they don't actually change the power structures in the workplace that create those attitudes or those outcomes. Um, and so these trainings tell workers that attitudes and emotions from their peers are changing the outcomes of their lives um, because they would rather that than take a good look at what they owe their workers. Um, a real durable change would come from workers organizing to actually assert their power and demand their rights be met. But these kinds of programs obviously aren't even going to get close to that. Um, so instead of creating more understanding between people with different experience, these programs create less. And they frame these differences in experience as barriers to the well-being of others. The only thing that they then say can solve this is more anti-discrimination training. And as Jen has said, this doesn't work. So one of the kind of main social justice theologies right now is privilege politics. And I just read a book called White Kids, Growing Up with Privilege in a Racially Divided America by Margaret Hagerman, who's a sociologist who did field work in an affluent school with mostly white kids. And when they were given the privilege exercise, they felt the need to protect it because what it did for them was it articulated everything that made their lives nice as a product of white supremacy. So if you're already part of the team and you're anti-racist and a person says, hey, look at your privilege and look at all of these things that may be easier for you or you have access to because of the you know, accident of your birth as X, Y, Z, you're probably going to go, oh, wow, I feel bad. I want other people to have those things. What do I do? But if you're not, or I mean, maybe m these kids might not be racist either. But when it's articulated that white supremacy is an economic program that ensures all of these wonderful things, it's no surprise that some people would be like, I love my white privilege and I need to protect it. And that's precisely what emerged from some of these trainings. And Famously, in 2008, the internal memo from a Google employee who was upset that his biological essentialism of women wasn't reflected in the diversity trainings and upset that they took place at all, articulated a lot of these things. Um, he was actively um, in community or sorry, in conversation with these ideologies um, rather than, you know, other kinds of trainings which take place at unions that do cover this. They do cover discrimination. They are also subject to Title VII, but they say racism is a problem for worker solidarity. Racism undermines worker solidarity and undermines worker power. And they have a ways to go to fix that as well, but the language and the framing is completely different. So um, on that note, um, it looks like we're running up on time, but I know yeah. that we talk about the nonprofit sector and like the philanthropic foundation world. And I really think that we should just like touch on that a little bit. So do you want to quickly like get into how you think the nonprofit sector kind of overlaps and like intertwines with the um, diversity industry? Um, and then I'll say just a few words on foundations after that. Um, and then maybe we can like I don't know, like throw out some ideas of what, you know, we know actually works in terms of making workplaces better for workers of color. Um, so take it away. All right. So nonprofits share the same set of um, motivations that for-profit firms have, except they just don't have to make a profit. They have financial incentives like a for-profit firm, but their financial incentives are courting the donor class or getting government grants. They also are businesses that have to meet certain goals and manage their workforce in order to do that. They are also liable under Title VII. And so they came to rely on the diversity industry in the exact same way as for-profit for industries did. They needed to be compliant 
they also need to be compliant in the way that they um, served the communities that they were a part of, because oftentimes they were providing vital social services that were contracted to them by state and local agencies. And if they didn't do this in a fair, non-discriminatory way, they would be liable. So we can see this sort of voluntary failure of the state to invest in social services or retrenchment, um, creating a dependency on nonprofits. And then these nonprofits are increasingly subject to scrutiny for how they're delivering these services. And one of the most famous criticisms of this dynamic is Kimberly Crenshaw's famous Stanford Law Review article that highlights these failures. So just to gloss over the article, which I think people should read because I think it's highly misunderstood, Crenshaw is pointing to issues with service provision at women's shelters. She's showing that certain women's shelters don't take into account that women needing their services may not speak English. And because of funding competitions with other nonprofits, they are not able to hire um, staff that can meet those needs. And she goes into this case by case by case. In some examples, she shows that women who are looking for services in a shelter may if they're women of color, may have other unmet needs and may be need, in need of food. They may not have stable housing at all. And they may be fleeing to this place because of interpersonal violence, but also have this set of other issues. And those shelters ended up being unfunded. This is actually directly a result of the way that nonprofits' dependence on state funding and donors creates funding gaps. And it's true that marginalized groups suffer more. But Crenshaw's intervention wasn't to say, let's give all people food um, or let's make sure everybody has a housing guarantee. Her intervention was to create a framework to explain the erasure of women of color and the ways that their needs were particular because of other kinds of oppressions like class, race, sexuality, or cultural and political motivations like a sense of honor, the distrust of police, and the inability to report because they were undocumented. So she she actually managed to change the nonprofit sector. Nonprofits became more niche in order to provision these services. And by their very nature, they're particularistic because they're courting the donor class and they're trying to get these grants and the way that they apply for them has to be very specific and narrow. Um, but the failure of the approach of intersectionality is that rather than looking at a universal program and, and seeing how that could affect the most marginalized groups, which could be an intersectional approach to universal programs, and that would be fine, Crenshaw takes more of an issue with the way that the funding structure allocates resources and not the retrenchment of the federal government and state governments not providing social services. And that's not to her fault. She was a lawyer. She's writing this as an intervention that's particular and very legalistic. But the problem is the diversity industry swallows these things up. And part of that is because there's kind of a revolving door between academia um, and particular fields in academia and then the diversity industry, the social justice and nonprofit world, and then the for-profit world. And so you see these figures emerging and emerging. And Crenshaw herself admits that the concept of intersectionality has spun way out of what she initially meant. Um, but the issue here is that firms, particularly nonprofits, are always looking for a way to better serve their customers that doesn't impact their bottom line. And their bottom line is to have a service to provide. So they're advocating for these na very narrow solutions. Um, and you see this lead to a particular emphasis on equity, providing very different services to different groups, depending on a diverse set of needs, rather than on liberation, which would be freeing people from hunger, from housing instability, or from dependence on relationships for their well-being. Um, so I'm going to throw it over to Jen to talk about foundations. foundations. <laughs> okay, so um, yeah, I mean, I think this actually like flows really well from what you just said about nonprofits having to adapt their agendas over time. 
Um, so, you know, I would say that, uh, or I mean, I think that a lot of people probably agree that foundations in many cases often end up shaping nonprofit agendas, sometimes even more than the nonprofits themselves, because after all, they're the ones with all the money. Uh, they're the ones that the nonprofits have to rely on for funding, right? So um, just a quick definition of foundations. I mean, lots of people probably know this already, but foundations are basically these giant tax exempt endowments of money that are governed by private boards. Um, and they give out money you know, to nonprofits and individuals um, as an act of philanthropy. So Mark Zuckerberg has a foundation, um, Bill and Melinda Gates famously have a foundation. Um, and like I said, they fund all kinds of things sort of across the political and social spectrum. Um, and much like nonprofits, I think in kind of a best case scenario, um, they do help fill a gap that's been sort of left by the erosion of the public sector. Um, but that said, foundations also help perpetuate the retrenchment of the state because they don't pay taxes. Um, they often function as these kinds of like tax shelters for billionaires and multimillionaires. Um, you know, the Trump Foundation is probably like the most cartoonish example. Like that's obviously just a front for hiding money. Um, but even if you look at something like the Gates Foundation, which I think is very um, committed to, you know, providing funding for education, they have a $46 billion endowment and they're only required by law to pay out 5% of that annually. So again, this is just a big pile of tax-free money that's sitting there. And then um, on top of that, foundations are sort of inherently anti-democratic because they have a lot of influence on sort of public life and even the political system. Um, I think that they exert you know, a lot of soft power um, but they're run by these extremely wealthy founders and, um, you know, a small handful of rich or at least affluent board members um, who kind of decide what agenda they're going to set uh, with obviously no input from like voters or the general public. Um, so there's there's obviously been a lot of really great research and writing on foundations. So I like won't linger on the drawbacks of the philanthropy model too much. Um, but I do want to say, um, you know, um, over the last couple of months, a number of foundations have sort of publicly recommitted to racial justice. So uh, you saw the Open Society Foundation, which was founded by George Soros. Uh, they recently pledged 220 million to racial justice and to black led organizations. Um, the Ford Foundation, I think a little before that, uh, said they were giving $1 billion to racial justice work. Um, and just today, Susan Sandler, who owns a foundation, um, and who's kind of this like liberal philanthropist who donated to Cory Booker and I think Kamala Harris, um, she announced that her foundation is going to be giving $200 million to racial justice initiatives as well. Oh, and I think that um, Mackenzie Scott, uh, the former wife of Jeff Bezos, who's now like, the richest mm -hmm. woman in the world, I think she was like, I'm, I'm also giving like a billion dollars to, um, to racial justice initiatives. So, Kale, can we do the first Ford Foundation slide? So right after the Ford Foundation announced um, their commitment or their big pledge to racial justice, um, they released a statement, and this is a quote drawn from that statement. Um, and I'll just read it out loud quickly. So um, uh, two program officers at the Ford Foundation wrote, the twin pandemics of COVID-19 and systemic racism have thrust the challenges Black people across the diaspora face into sharp relief. But anti-blackness and the struggle for freedom and racial equality globally is nearly as old as white supremacy itself. At the Ford Foundation, we are proud to support individuals and organizations worldwide that are forging the path to freedom, equality, and justice in the U.S. and abroad. And like that's that's pretty radical language, right? Like that that again is a departure from the kind of feel-good multiculturalism diversity of the '90s. However, Kale, can we get the second Ford Foundation slide? So this is something that uh, Ford Foundation President Darren Walker said just a few years earlier. Um, so he wrote, let us bridge the philosophies of Smith, um, Adam Smith, and Carnegie and King and break the scourge mm. of inequality. For when we do, to paraphrase another of Dr. King's most powerful insights, we will at last bend the demand curve for <laughs> justice. <laughs> And I like I love this quote because I oh, think it kind of perfectly illustrates it's amazing. Like, it's amazing, right? Like it perfectly illustrates the motivations and the limitations of foundations. So like 
you know, for the most part, I think even the ones that say, oh, we're committed to solving inequality, whether that's economic inequality or, you know, uh, racial inequality. Um, and even when they use this very radical or activist language, they're really only interested in doing that within the bounds of the market. Um, and then by extension, because, you know, um, because they because they're so powerful and they set the terms of these nonprofit agendas just by virtue of controlling the purse strings, like you can see how this type of agenda, which is to say uh, this this uh, sort of um, dynamic where you can be like really radical on race, but at the same time still want to keep capitalism intact. Um, I think Cedric Johnson calls this militant liberalism, which is a great phrase. Um, but you can basically see how this bleeds out to the rest of the nonprofit world. So yeah, I absolutely. Think, yeah, um, good stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think, okay, so I think on that note, um, because we're kind of running up on our time, like, let's just yeah. take a couple minutes to kind of wrap up and say, like, what does make sense, perhaps, in the workplace, since we spent, like, all our time, like, talking about the yeah. things that are bad. All the negative things. All the just negatives. one more negative thing. Just one, one more, more negative, negative thing. Um, <laughs> There's a great quote that I found in a book, Nonprofits for Hire, that explains exactly the dynamic you're talking about. And I think it distills the role that they have. So it, um, he writes, in liberal welfare state regimes, nonprofit service organizations emerge to fulfill three key functions. One, they supplement government provision, obvious. Two, they can reinforce the prevailing government policy emphasizing work norms, self-sufficiency and markets. And three, they can serve as a vehicle for pushing expanded government provision. So your explanation, I think, really focused in on too, and I think it's really important because none of these firms, regardless of the intentions of the people that work within them, can actually achieve long-term changes for the people who receive their services. They mm -hmm. cannot do it. You know, mm -hmm. like the Ford Foundation isn't saying, well, we're just going to give everyone a house or, <laughs> right, we're going to build free public housing that's right. locally controlled and democratically controlled. Like they're locally not controlled. saying that. Yeah, right, they're right. never, they're never going to say right. that. No, I mean, it's like so, what you were saying about the nonprofits. Like it has to be more particularistic than that, um, at yeah. least in their schema. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So right. what actually works? So. Um, I'm just going to keep this really brief, but I, I do want to say that, you know, just as we have a lot of research that shows that anti-racism training doesn't really work, um, the good news is that we also have a large body of research that shows um, what does work. And basically what works, um, and this is like a little boring and like not, you know, not that exciting, but what works is when you put people to work with each other on a common project as equals. That tends to reduce bias, that tends to reduce stereotyping. Um, and I think that the simplicity of that is, is really interesting because as you had sort of mentioned earlier, like what's the best way to get people working together on a common project toward you know, a common goal as equals in the workplace? The answer is unions. Um, and uh, I, I think Megan Day recently wrote an article in Jacobin sort of looking at a different study that recently came out that shows that lo and behold, uh, unions reduce white workers' prejudice. Um, and then of course, we also know that unions famously help to reduce um, or shrink pay gaps between men and women um, in the workplace. They also help shrink pay disparities between black workers and white workers. Um, and, you know, I, I think it goes without saying that we can't just snap our fingers and like unionize every every workplace like it's easier said than done. But I guess the takeaway is like when you look at the scorecard between anti racism training and unions um, and look at what they've actually achieved in terms of making things better in the workplace, especially for workers of color unions win. Yeah, I've got a great anecdote about this from my aunt who worked in a tobacco factory. And she said that a plant had closed and they were relocating the workers to the factory that she worked in, which was mostly black people. And the people coming in were mostly white. And when they got in, they were, you know, feeling precarious and potentially threatened. And so they were like working late for free. They were going above and beyond, kind of like sucking up to the managers. And people got really mad because they were like, why are you coming in here as new workers? And like disrupting what we've built here. And instead of, you know, any racial animosity arising out of it, all of the black workers who were very active in their union invited them all to a meeting and they were like, listen, we run this factory. 
They don't run it. They don't get to tell you what to do. We didn't work 15 years in this place and, and start this union to let these other people tell us what we get to do. She was like, my aunt was telling me, you know, she said, we know better than they do. We don't have to depend on them for anything. Yeah, that rules. And it worked. Yeah. It worked. And another example comes from my grandma, who was a pediatric nurse who went on strike with the other nurses in her unit. And she said there was no color on the picket line. And this was during Jim Crow. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I think these anecdotes also illustrate a broader point, which is that when people are actually not in competition, which is so baked into these workplaces, including in nonprofits, they are more generous with each other, they work better together, and they are more compassionate and accepting of other people. And I think you see this with um, even studies in these firms, these for-profit firms. The Harvard Business Review said that one of the effective ways to reduce bias was just to have like team management instead of one manager. Um, so collective action in whatever iteration seems to be effective, but the thing that unions can do is they can make enduring change. Because even if you have a diversity training that works for everybody, you are still dependent on the goodwill of the people who control your life for like, your basic needs. And we can't have that focus. We can't say, oh, we need to empower more generous people who then might leave. And then what do we have? We have to start all over again. It has to be rank and file demands that can become institutionally um, protected because they are brought into a union contract. A hundred percent. I feel like we could definitely end on that note, <laughs> on that last <laughs> word. Um, so thank you, Ariella and Kale and to Boscar and for the Jacobin team for putting this on. Um, I had a lot of fun. And thank we'll you, you, Jen. Thanks. Could talk about this forever. Forever. <laughs> <laughs>